Today we're on page 11 of the chapter 12 AP Chemistry Packet and we're going to be talking about collision theory. This theory proposes that reactions of molecules depend on the energy and the orientation of the collisions. Reaction rates will increase with increased number of collisions and or increased effectiveness of collisions. So if you want a reaction to be faster, you can either impact the number of collisions and or you can impact the effectiveness of collisions. So if we take a look at temperature, if you want to increase the temperature, you will increase the rate of a reaction because you will increase the number of collisions and you will also increase the effectiveness of collisions because they're going to hit harder. Okay, when you increase the number of collisions, then that's because they're going to hit more often because they're moving faster. So remember, temperature affects the speed of the molecules. So if they move faster, they're going to hit more often and they're going to hit harder. So more of them have the activation energy that you need to get the reaction to occur. All right, let's suppose we deal with concentration. If you want to make a reaction faster, you would increase the concentration because when you increase the concentration, you will increase the number of collisions. You will not increase the effectiveness because they're still hitting at the same speed on the average, but you'll have more collisions. Next, we're going to talk about pressure. Pressure only affects gases. You're going to increase the pressure. What you're going to do is you're going to make a higher number of collisions because the gas particles will hit more often. You're not going to change their effectiveness because they're not hitting harder. They're just going to hit more often. With surface area, you want to increase the surface area to increase the rate, which means you would have to decrease the particle size. You want them smaller pieces, and that's going to expose more of it. That will again increase the number of collisions. It will not increase their effectiveness. They're not going to hit harder. They're just going to hit more often. Lastly, you want to add a catalyst to increase a rate. And when you add a catalyst, remember that's going to lower the activation energy. And when you lower the activation energy, what you're going to do is you're going to increase the effectiveness of the collisions because you're going to have a better orientation anytime they collide due to the presence of the catalyst. So this is the only factor that affects only effectiveness, whereas these factors, surface area, pressure, concentration, affect only the number of collisions, and temperature increases both the number of collisions and the effectiveness. So you can see the temperature is definitely the factor that has the biggest impact. And there's a, a general rule with temperature that if you increase the temperature um, by 10 degrees, if you increase the temperature, whoops, do that again. If you increase the temperature by 10 degrees, you're pretty much going to double the rate. So approximately double the rate for increasing the temperature by 10 degrees Celsius. That's just a general rule. If you look at the diagrams at the bottom of the page, you'll see that they uh, reinforce what we were saying before. If you have more particles in a sample, you're going to have more collisions, so there's going to be a faster rate. Don't forget that this diagram right here shows the potential energy of reactants, products, and activated complex. And of course, this is going to represent an exothermic reaction because the ending is lower than the beginning. And um, the other two graphs are the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution graphs of samples of um, any type of substance. We're now on page 12 of the chapter 12 AP Chemistry Packet on Kinetics. We're going to begin this page talking about potential energy diagrams. This diagram is certainly an exothermic reaction. And remember how we understood that, that you have to break bonds. And that's what this part of the diagram is. So this is endothermic because it's broke endo, remember? Broke endo. And the right side of the graph is where you are 
making buns. So this is form XO. And you could tell that more energy was released to form the bonds than what was required to make the bonds. So then this reaction overall was exothermic. Okay, so just remember that here you're breaking bonds. Breaking bonds here of the reactants. And here you are forming bonds. Of the products. This is not really doing what I want to do here. Form bonds for the products. And ratio of these two is going to determine whether it's endo or exo overall. Okay, now let's go to down lower in the page and we're going to see another potential energy diagram. There's a correction here that you need to make. This really should say 42 kilojoules right here. 42, and we'll see that when we go through it. All right, if you take a look at the energies here, you'll see that this starts at 10 kilojoules, and this ends, let's say, at 34 kilojoules, and let's say the top is 76 kilojoules. So if you want to get the activation energy, the activation energy is the difference between the beginning and the top. So we'll scroll down a little bit to fill this in. The activation energy for the forward reaction is going to be 66 kilojoules because it's a difference between 10 and 76. So the difference is the activation energy, which is 66 kilojoules. Now you want to get the delta H, and the delta H is the difference between the beginning to the end. So 10 up to 34 is a difference of positive 24. So we're going to write 24 kilojoules for the delta H. Now let's take a look at the reverse reaction. For the reverse, you're going to go backwards. So if we start at 34 and we go all the way up to 76, that's the activation energy. That's going to be positive 42 kilojoules because you're going up, of course. And now you have to be careful with the delta H for the reverse because you're going from 34 down to 10. So that's a negative 24 kilojoules. Now let's suppose we had a catalyst. And we had a catalyst. Let's say that this goes to 50. So we're going to go up to 50 and then back down again. All right, so now we want the activation energy for the forward with a catalyst. That's going to be from here to here. So 10 to 40, or sorry, 10 to 50 is going to be 40 kilojoules. And then the delta H is still from 10 to 34. So that's going to be positive 24 kilojoules. Now when you go reverse, you're going to see the delta H, oh, sorry, the activation energy is going to be from 34 up to 50. So that's going to be a difference of 16 kilojoules. And the delta H is still going to be for the reverse from 34 down to 10. So that's still going to be negative 24 kilojoules. And what you notice is that the catalyst only affects the activation energy. The catalyst does not affect the delta H. And do understand that the catalyst affects both the forward and the reverse. As you can see here, the activation energy was 40 um, forward with a catalyst, whereas it used to be 66. And the same thing reverse, it used to be 42, and now it went down to 16.